We are starting off this last week of minefield uh, sabotage style. Is that okay with everybody? Listen, uh, Pastor Tim did not know anything like this was happening, so we're completely surprising him, which he hates, so that's why we did it. Uh, but many of you know that October is Pastor's Appreciation Month, and we cannot, yeah, come on. We cannot let this opportunity go by without honoring our leader, Pastor Tim. So thank you so much, Pastor Tim, just for, listen, come on, give it up. This guy, if you're not standing in legacy, you need to stand to your feet. Listen, he's the real deal. You know, us on staff, we have the, uh, we have the honor of seeing this guy live his life up close. And let me tell you that uh, what you see on stage is what you get in real life. And so I just want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for your leadership. I want to thank your family uh, because ministry is a family job. And so thank you, Laura Lee and Amen. Audrey, Lauren. Amen. Um, it's such a huge honor to be able to do this with you. We got you some gifts. I'll hold on to this until after uh, this experience. But I just wanted to just stop for a moment, if we could, as a church, uh, and just extend our hands if you feel comfortable here in Lancaster just to pray. Uh, for Pastor Tim in this next season of your ministry, because, brother, we are so thankful for you. Thank you. So if you could go ahead and do that, let's pray as a church. Yes. Heavenly Father, God, we, uh, we come together just thankful for this man and for this mantle and this anointing that you've put on him. Yes, God. Um, God, I think about all the people who could be my pastor, and God, I'm so thankful that you intersected my life and you intersected all of the people that are in our church with the life of this man and with his family, God. Uh, my life has changed because of how you've spoken to him. Uh, the way I live my life is shaped because of the way you speak to him and what he brings to us on a week in and week out basis. So, uh, God, we just, uh, in a moment of gratitude today, honor him. Um, God, we thank you for him. Um, God, we pray for this next season of his ministry, God, that, that it would be even more fruitful than any season he's ever seen in the past. God, I truly believe that what you've given him, that the way you speak to him, it's not only going to reach people in the community we're about to enter in. It's not only going to reach people in Lancaster, but God, it's going to reach people all across this state, all across this country, all around this world. And so, God, I just pray that you continue to gift him, God, that you would, your anointing, uh, that there would be another level in this next season that we see. God, and uh, we just surround him, him with our prayers, God, surround his family with, with our prayers, and God, we pray that you protect them, God, and we thank you for them, and all God's people said together, amen, come on, let's celebrate him one more time, church, come on, get on your feet, let's honor him today. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can be seated. I appreciate that, man, it's a uh, you know, it is actually my honor to be able to lead this church. It really is. The greatest call and the greatest honor of my life is leading this church. And so thank you guys for sabotaging me in this moment and <laughs> making that awkward. But that's okay. Hey, I want to welcome you to church today. Would you all help me here in Lithopolis welcome everybody in Lancaster? Come on, we just love our Lancaster family. If you're watching this online another time. Uh, it's so great to have you with us. If you're new with us, you're catching us on the tail end of what we feel is a really, really important conversation. And that is talking about our minds, talking about the battle within our minds. The truth is this, all of us are fighting a battle in our minds. I, I don't care how great a childhood you had or how messed up your childhood is. We all are going to face fear. We're, we're going to face moments where we can get anxious, where we worry, where, where we feel maybe depressed, where, where we feel afflicted in our minds. And so my, my desire throughout this entire series of talks is that I want to start conversations. There's nothing that I was going to be able to say in, in one message or a series of talks that, that is maybe going to just kind of like, it's going to fix everything in your life. And I know that. But what I hope is that we would open our mouths. I pray that, and this is my heart's desire, is that if you are wrestling with some form of mental anguish, if you've been depressed and you've never told anyone, if you feel anxious all the time and you're young, then I, I, I pray that you would just tell somebody. Just open your mouth, just begin, because I believe that there's freedom that can begin to come when we begin to tell others about what our struggle is so we can be in this fight together. I don't believe that you have to face this alone. That's what the community is for. And we say all the time, it's okay to not be okay. You don't have to believe to belong here. 
You can come here and say, I don't believe what you believe. Maybe you're an atheist, agnostic, you're some other religion. That's so cool. Come on, hang out because, listen, we believe that we get better together. I personally believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe it because I have found hope in Jesus. That's what you find in a room like this is I have found it in my life, and I pray that someday you will find it the way I have. And today as we close out the series of talks, I wanted to do something kind of special, a little bit different. And so this is not going to be just a typical message, but I told you this last week that I wanted to bring some counselors in today. And I, I wanted to bring some people who are part of this church who care desperately for the people of this church, but also have given their lives to being able to serve people who struggle with, with mental illness, who struggle with depression, anxiety, all of these different things. And, and so I, I'm going to invite a couple counselors and we're just going to have a conversation and you get to listen in. And I think it's going to be helpful for you. I, I think it's going to maybe be freeing for you to hear from some other people who are working in this area. Let me, just, let me just preface this by saying that this is not counseling for all of you. So I know you're thinking, this is great. I didn't have to go pay for it. I don't have to go see a counselor. And, and it's going to be awesome. But let me just say this. This is not counseling for you. We're going to try to navigate some subjects. But listen, there are things that counselors may tell one person you need to do this and would not tell someone else to do that. Every situation is different. So here's what I want to say. This is not counseling. These are counselors who have a story and who have wisdom that they want to impart to our church. And I hope this is so helpful for you today. And so I got two counselors that I want to share with you. And so would you do me a great favor here at X Church? Would you put your hands together and welcome Kay Kasberg and Lisa Neely to the stage? Come on, give it up for Kay and Lisa. Man, you brought your fan club with you. Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat. You have a seat. You don't need that. What are you doing with this? You don't need that. There you go. <laughs> now I need counseling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you. It's, it's, it's Thanks awesome for having to have us. you guys. Um, Kay, let, let me talk about you first for a moment. I, I, wanted to, I, got, I got my little bio on you, Kay. I've known, actually, you guys may not know this. I have known Kay Kasberger. Uh, Kay Kasberger. <laughs> I just messed that up. Kay really Kasberger. Really well. You think I'm... <laughs> I've actually known Kay um, longer than I've pretty much known every single person in our church. So uh, I'm not saying that so that you can get any dirt from her on, you know, on me. Don't, don't do that. But, but I have it. But um, I first met Kay when I was five years old, right? Somewhere around five years old. And uh, so she's a special person in my life, a friend of mine. But Kay, she has been working in this field for 13 years. Um, she actually founded, uh, I got this written down, Hope Counseling Center and still serves as a clinical supervisor there. She teaches uh, master's students in a counseling program at Ashland Theological Seminary. Um, and so, Kay, why don't you just tell me, just, just briefly, what got you into this field of study and counseling people? Okay. Um, hi. <laughs> Good to see y'all. So, um, so I grew up in a family um, that had pretty severe mental health issues. And... Um, uh, not many of you know this, but um, my father and my brother struggled with schizoaffective disorder, which is like um, a really tough disorder. It's like a combination of schizophrenia and mood disorders. So um, I kind of like went through my life bouncing back and forth, um, kind of like resenting them being embarrassed of, especially my dad, but then I looked just like him, so I was scared I was going to be like him. Um, then I found Jesus and, um, and matured as, um, you know, I probably would have matured a bit anyway, hopefully, but I matured. And, um, but then I realized I really loved them both. They were precious people who could not help yeah. um, what they happened to have genetically. Now, it was untreated, so they could have helped that part. Um, but so I really wanted to spend my life helping precious people wow. like them who, you know, the culture kind of looks at people with schizophrenia in a really, uh, sometimes, yeah. uh, in a kind of standoffish way. And I wanted to be there for those people. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Come on. Let's <laughs> give it up for that. That's... Lisa, I know this is your favorite thing to do. <laughs> 
Uh, you're going to have to hold the mic up when you talk. I'm just telling you. This is not her thing. She was like, I, I'll one-on-one -on -one in a room, but right one-on-many. On okay. This is not her thing. But uh, Lisa, you've worked in this field for 12 years, right? Yes. And um, you currently serve as a clinical director and supervisor uh, for Port 45 Recovery. Um, you've done a lot of work with homeless population, dealing with addiction, trauma, all, all versions of mental illness. And so I guess the same question, like what, what even got you into this field? Well, I, uh, I grew up in a very chaotic home uh, with a lot of abuse. Uh, several of my family members also had untreated mental health issues. And um, being raised in a home like that, I had a very uh, poor view of God. Mm. Um, I saw him as angry, as uh, not merciful. Um, and he seemed demanding and uh, like expecting perfection. And that's how I saw him. And I remember praying as a child, I always prayed for forgiveness because I was just uh, so fearful and I never felt I received it. So uh, due to growing up in an environment like that, I found that um, uh, as an adult that I needed help with overcoming some of my traumas. And so I began therapy and uh, I found that uh, so much healing, especially in my relationship with God. And um, I came to Christ and I found hope and I found help. Amen. And I wanted to be able to offer that kind of hope to other people. Wow, come on, that's so good, isn't it? That's good. Um, you guys kind of mentioned growing up in, in homes where you dealt with things that caused mental illness or people that um, were mentally ill in those situations. Um, what would you guys say to, to someone that is here, and maybe even through this series we've been talking about it, what would you say to someone who has a loved one, a friend, a family member that maybe is battling a version of mental illness, whether, whether it's been diagnosed or not, or something they see, like, I mean, I think sometimes we think about ourselves, but I know so many of you have, have loved ones and people you care about that you know are experiencing things like this. And it's like, how do we help them? What do we do with, with family members or people? Well, first of all, I think um, the key is to listen mm. to them. Uh, I think that um, like in the- You mean not preach to them. Yeah. <laughs> Start by listening. Start by listening. Yeah. I think the counseling world has like a, a word that we use for listening deeply, like really deeply. Like it would be like a word for listening and um, not just um, to pass the time mm. while you figure out what you're going to say next. Yeah, I'm good at that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Are yeah we that's my good? wife. I'm really good at that. <laughs> Honey, cover your ears. I don't want you to hear this part, what she just says, because this might not work at home. And, and it's called empathy. Oh, okay. And, and so what, <laughs> what it... I walked into that, what yeah. It means, <laughs> what it means is like listening to what the other person is feeling, oh, yeah. not just to what they're saying. Mm. And so when you have people in your life who are struggling, say they're depressed, say that they're anxious, yeah. um, it, what it's amazing to me because what there is actually like, a, there are a lot of people that get help just if somebody listens mm. like, and says, wow, that sucks. Yeah. You are having a hard time. Mm. And it's amazing how just that mm. is so helpful for people. Wow. So That's good. Uh, you know, uh, for myself, I felt uh, being validated was so important to me because mm -hmm. I had never been validated. And I think it's our instinct to correct people and their feelings. And um, sometimes we just need to say, you know, it's okay to feel the way you want to feel. You know, mm. you're feeling a certain way, and, and that's okay. Yeah. Um, we, d as professionals, we don't, you know, counsel uh, family members or friends, but we listen. And even when we listen, it's, it can be exhausting. And I think it's so important to take care of yourself, yeah. you know, when you have a family, family member like that. And um, sometimes that means drawing a line or a boundary with that family member. Yeah. That's so. good. And, and this is really a radical thought, but we could pray yeah. for them. Yeah. Pray for them. I, I, I do like, though, the, the perspective that, you know, we've been talking about throughout this series of talks that, you know, we don't need to be their savior. You know, I think that's important to hear. I think sometimes the most important thing that we could do is we could just listen, that, that we would listen to them and not to fix their situation, their problem, 
Um, I don't think it's always a, a situation or a problem to be fixed. I don't, you know, feelings and thoughts and emotions, things that we go through, but really listening to people and, and trying to see beyond, um, see beyond their um, expressions. See beyond, I think sometimes we get turned off by people when they're isolating themselves and then you can get angry. Or, or the way they respond, mm -hmm. and, and it may be coming from something else. And I think that becomes be sensitive to them and pray for them. Yeah. Have, have you ever been in a situation where you're just, like, feeling really anxious and you just are being mean? And, but what you really need is um, you're actually pushing people away. Mm. And the, the thing you really need is someone to come up and hug you. Yeah. And, and I think if we can see beyond their their actions, yeah. even beyond their words sometimes, and see who they really are. That's love. That's good. That's good. Um, also throughout the series, we've been dealing with a variety of different topics. We, we've talked about depression. Um, we've talked about a lot about anxiety, um, dealing with fear. These are all things that we've talked about. One area that I did not really get into very much, because it's a very personal thing, and it's different for a, a lot of people, um, is how trauma can affect our minds and um, you know I think sometimes that's why I've been talking throughout the, the series of talks to say you don't know somebody else's battle you you don't know the situation they went through you don't know what they grew up with you you don't know their trauma and and so this is where empathy comes in but Lisa may, maybe you could just speak to um, how does trauma affect our our minds our mental health when we deal with uh, mental health clients, we usually are asking them, you know, what are your symptoms? You know, what's bothering you? And you get a, a list of symptoms and you look at the criteria and that's how we diagnose, yeah. like for instance, depression. So, but when we work with trauma patients, we, uh, we ask the question, what happened to you? Mm. And uh, we do that because trauma is so complicated and it impacts people differently. Um, what one person may react to trauma, another person would act differently to the same trauma. And sometimes uh, one person can be traumatized by something and another person in the same situation wouldn't be. So it's, it's very personal. Um, some people don't even recognize when they've been traumatized. Um, a lot of people who grew up uh, with trauma because they feel that maybe they uh, deserved it mm. or, you know, or, uh, or it was normal. You know, so um, there's all kinds of trauma. You know, there's emotional loss, uh, there's combat, bullying is a trauma, uh, abandonment, um, even you can have trauma from accidents and uh, natural disasters. Yeah. So um, for myself, I experienced physical and sexual abuse and it's taken me most of my life uh, to find healing for that. And uh, with trauma, it's very important to seek help and you cannot do the work on your own. Uh, it's something that you just can't do alone because uh, naturally you want to avoid the traumatic memories and that's the problem. It, it may seem kind of funny, but with trauma often comes shame. And um, we often think of shame as like, well, um, if I did something to be ashamed of, then I will feel shame. Um, but actually that's guilt. So if I did something wrong, I'm gonna feel guilty for it. Shame is when you believe I am something wrong. And, and so um, a lot of times people, some people might not understand it because it seems kind of funny, but like um, people who have been uh, exploited, harmed by other people feel very ashamed. They might, they might have thoughts like I am filthy I am evil, I am dirty, um, and, and it doesn't make any sense because these things were done to them, but it's a very big part of trauma. And people who have a shame-based thinking, um, they have this internal dialogue going on that says terrible things about themselves, and these dialogues are based on lies maybe they've heard um, in their childhood or they've internalized them and they believe them, so both Kay and I have struggled uh, with these kinds of lies, and one of the most damaging, I believe, was that we're not worthy of love. And so for me, the most important step in my journey was recognizing the lies. So you did you, you're saying that people that have maybe gone through trauma, that that's actually something that they might actually feel 
is that they're not worthy of love just simply because they went through a traumatic experience. Correct. Exactly. You know? yeah. And so uh, for me, sharing the, those lies to somebody else was a healing part because it kind of took away the power of the lie. Mm, yeah, that's good. And um, so stopping the lies in my mind was the hardest thing for me. And I used prayer and worship mm -hmm. and finally was able to overpower the lies with truth. That's awesome. We've been talking about that through the series. That I think that's the... The, the battle that we face in our minds, um, you know, that the devil will constantly try to lie to us. And I, I just know that in our church as a pastor, I've seen um, and we've counseled many within our community that have dealt with real trauma, severe trauma. And um, I think probably one of the things that most people who deal with trauma think is uh, a lot of times, maybe you guys can speak to this, but they think I can deal with this, okay. that I I can fix this, right. or I'll just put it behind me. Mm -hmm. I just, I'll stop thinking about it. I'm gonna get away, and it's just like, I'm moving forward. And yet, what a lot of people don't realize and what contributes to so much of their constant pain and their, their, what they can't get free is because they haven't dealt with it. And most of the time, we wanna run from pain. You know, I, I, I've gone through some experiences where I've, I've felt a traumatic response to them and the last thing that I want to do is I want to go back to that place. The last thing I want to do is I want to open up something that I've kind of let scab over, you know, but it was never really dealt with the right way. And you know, in a regular wound, if you don't deal with it the right way, guess what? It's going to get infected. And so sometimes you're going to have to. I'm going to say this right now because there are so many people that are watching this right now. That some of you have traumatic experiences in your life and you haven't dealt with it. And maybe it's been five years, 10 years, or a lifetime. And you think, I, I think I'm over it. But we don't realize is how trauma affects our relationships, how trauma affects those things in our life. W w would you agree? I know, Kay, you were telling me about this, that one of the things that people um, tend to believe or they can get to a place sometimes because of trauma it is a place of self-hatred. Right. Yeah, I, I think that um, self-hatred is, um, for me, it was a stronghold. Mm. And um, I'm sure that that's true for many people who are right here with me. And it's kind of such a stronghold that um, I, I felt this hardness in myself whenever I would think about me. And other people would say, what the heck? You know, I, I would always be kind of like the life of the party. I'm a gregarious extrovert. But inside, I felt this hatred. And um, so coming to Jesus um, helped to some extent, but there were still these lies that were wedged deep, deep within me that said that I was something that I'm not. They were just lies. And I had to get help to work some of those lies out. That's good. And so if you've gone through something traumatic, I think the message here today is don't run from it but also don't face it alone. Exactly. You, you can, you're not gonna get healing on your own. I'm just gonna tell you right now. You guys have both, we've talked about this. Right. You will not get healing on your own. You need to go to a counselor. You need to go to people you trust who can walk you through and maybe even go back through it. But it's the only way that you're gonna get, get whole on the other side of that. Another subject that um, I think really affects our culture today, we're seeing it more and more in younger people as well. Um, it's something I talked about last week, which is depression. Mm -hmm. And um, so many uh, of these things, we've talked about anxiety, worry, fear, uh, trauma, can really trigger or can cause people to spiral into a place of depression. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know this because I've talked with both of you that depression is something you both have dealt with. Right. And, and so I want to kind of just camp here for a moment, if we could, and just talk because I feel like this affects so many people in our culture today, it might not be, as I talked about last week, it might not be a persistent um, form of depression, but I promise you, you can go through an experience where you may go into that place, um, or it could be a, a constant battle that you deal with. And so, uh, Kay, like, what would you say to somebody who um, maybe is dealing with depressive thoughts? They may or may not be suicidal. 
But we often find that depression is one of those key things that leads people to suicidal thoughts and, and maybe even to attempt to take their life. And so what, what would you say in this area of depression? Well, first of all, it's really scary and it's really hard. If you battle it or if you um, know someone who battles it, there's this feeling of powerless that sometimes happens where you're like, um, I'm being overtaken by a feeling because it can be so intense. And so the first thing I want to say is um, this might sound harsh, but like everyone here and myself included, you are responsible for your mental health. You are. No one else can do it for you. And so we, we might have been born with a predisposition for depression. I was, okay? Like I dodged the bullet on the schizophrenia thing, okay? But like I didn't on the depression thing. Can you hold on for a second? Because I, I think this is important because some people could be battling it and think that it's something they've done or why am I messed right. up and, and feeling this way all the time. Right. And it could be, you're saying that even genetics can play into depression, correct? Genetics, there are so many reasons that um, people, like I think that we've been taught even from the pulpit at times. Not like, here. Right. <laughs> Come on now. Don't, don't, no. All right. Okay. <laughs> Not here. <laughs> but we've been taught from many pulpits that, um, you know, if you are depressed, it's because you don't have faith or it's, yeah. it's only because you're not thinking right. Yeah. Just th it's stinking thinking. Like, get your stinking, thinking, thinking. right. Stinking <laughs> thinking. I'll preach right there. I, <laughs> you got stinking thinking. Give me a microphone. I might use Watch that. Don't, don't knock it too much. <laughs> but, but like if... There are so many other, there's, there's genetics. I mean, I think I have a genetic just predisposition to it. Now, here's the deal. There's other reasons, too. Trauma, loss. There's a million yeah. reasons. If yeah. you have a thyroid problem, if you have a brain tumor, you will be depressed. Okay? Wow. And the talking cure will not help you. Yeah. Okay? So let's just be honest here. Yeah. But, but here's the deal. If you are depressed, guess what? You are responsible for your own mental health, and you need to do whatever it takes to deal with your depression. And if you have schizophrenia, guess what? The same thing applies, and it might be harder because that thing's tougher. But guess what? You're responsible, and I hope you'll do it. So I personally attempted suicide twice before I was 16. I know what despair feels like, and I know what severe depression feels like, but every person that I have known, and I have known many, who wanted to take their own life and didn't, is glad they didn't. Amen. Come on. Amen. What a message. So, so you, when you're in that dark place, remember, make a commitment now. I am telling you now, I will never take my own life. I, I won't. But here's the deal with, with suicide. I'm taking all, all Tim's no, go for it. thunder. But um, here's the deal with, I think, like, have you ever seen the commercials? And they say, if you take this medication and if you have suicide th suicidal thoughts, stop taking it. Well, here's the deal. If a medication can impact your brain and can make you have suicidal thoughts, guess what? There might be some brains that are more given to have suicidal thoughts. Again, I have one of those brains. It's okay. Yeah. If you have one of those brains, it's your responsibility to never let yourself get so low that those thoughts start. I call it a high water mark. Now, I can spiral down into depression, but and I may never get off of the spiral of depression, but guess what? I don't let myself spiral down. That's just, I might always live on the top, 
but I know, and here's why, because I've done my work, and I know my triggers, and I know how to counter my triggers. It's hard work. I didn't just get saved and know all this stuff. I had to work. Mm, that's good. I had to do that's my good. work. The, real quick, um, the, b before we move on, and Lisa, I, I know I'd love you to be able to talk about depression, because um, you, you've mentioned to me that you've battled with it as well. Um, you said triggers there. Could you just really speak to what are some triggers, some things you know, maybe not in your own life, but just in general, what are things that maybe could be triggers for people that they've been battling with this, they've never talked to a counselor, they don't even realize, they don't know. What, what are some basic triggers that may cause people to spiral, that may wrestle with it all the time? It, it may be something that you've heard as a kid. It may be something like, you're a failure. You're never gonna add up to anything. Mm. It may be, it may be um, you know, something that you've just kept a secret all your life that you did. It may be that you actually feel like a failure and maybe there's a thread of truth to it. Maybe you did something that didn't work out, mm. but then it gets all blown up. Yeah. There are, for me, there's only about two triggers, but I'm telling you, they'll take me from zero to negative a thousand in one second. And I, and I know what they are, and I don't let myself go there. Wow, that's good. I, I think this is so important, it's so critical, because if some of you have never talked to a counselor, one of the things I think a counselor could help you do is know what those triggers are. That's right, yeah. I love what she's saying. You, you gotta take responsibility for yourself. Right. Uh, you know, if you have loved ones, you got people that care about you, like this is on you to, you, you need to talk to somebody That's and right. you need to walk through this and say, okay, these are those things. Cause like what you're saying, you, you could have been told you're a loser and you're a failure. That's right. And then you go start a, a business venture or you're trying to do a major right. project and it fails. And it was one little thing, one little thing. but all of a sudden it reaffirms what you've believed exactly. about yourself and you spiral out of control. Exactly. And so I think that's, I just think that's really helpful. It's insightful, thank you. Lisa, you, you've talked uh, uh, to me about how you've kind of battled with depression. Can you just tell me like, what's your story? What's your perspective? How is it maybe different than Kay's? Because everybody's story, even they have battled with depression is kind of different. Right, you know, Kay was able to find her balance without medication. Uh, however, that wasn't my case. I, I need them to take the medication. It's how I care for myself. And I've tried to go off the medication before and uh, with no success. Mm. And so sometimes it's difficult to find a, a medication that works for you. Um, but keep trying because there are, uh, there are some good medications out there that can help you. And uh, it's okay to need that kind of help. Yeah. We're going to say it again. It's okay if you need that kind of help. It's okay if you need some medication to help you every single day to be able to manage this because one of the things that um, I think you guys could maybe agree with, there's some people who battle depression and they're probably going to battle this fight their entire lives. That's right. They're gonna, you, you've told me that you feel like this is something that you will probably battle, I think as well, your entire life. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that you brought up that, that I know is kind of a big topic, a big term um, in the counseling world, in the psychological world, is self-care. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned taking care of yourself. W what is it today that um, self-care really is? Why is it important? Can you guys maybe just speak to that for a moment? Well, first of all, I think it's important to know what it's not. <laughs> because I was almost Pampering allergic. Pampering yourself, and <laughs> I got to go on vacation, and you got the kids, honey. I'm good. Exactly. I need self-care time. Like, I, when I was growing up, I was almost allergic to it because, um, uh, to be honest with you, my dad, it felt like that's all he ever did was take care of himself, okay? And he never attended anything that we, you know, did. He never, but, but the reality of it now I see is different that he was, you know, suffering. So, but, so I was, like, going to be superwoman, and I was, like, going to always serve others always help others, and I was just gonna like be bionic, right? And, and guess what happens when you think you're bionic is you fall apart every like couple weeks because you matter too. And of course, I, I also had self-hatred, and so I didn't think I mattered anyway. I mean, it was almost like Christian suicide 
but it really wasn't, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and so I had to learn, first of all, that I matter, and Amen. you matter too. Yeah. And, and, and this is a journey that isn't, um, it's like a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. And we have to take care of ourselves. It's like in the airplane, when the oxygen mask comes down, you better take it so you can help someone else. Yeah, that's good, take care of yourself. Lisa, what are some things that people, um, that you guys have, and I know this isn't counseling, so every situation's different, but what are some things that you guys have, have told people at times that say, hey, how, how can they care for themselves? What are some things that people can do that you guys have maybe suggested? For me, you know, if I, I'm working with uh, someone who's a believer, it's going to be different than someone who's not, of course, yeah. but for me, you know, um, Salvation has helped me so much, and I think that that's, you know, uh, for me, it's, uh, it was a spiritual battle at one time as well, but um, I couldn't do this battle by myself. Yeah. You know, he, he helped me through it, and uh, dealing with these types of issues are so difficult, and uh, don't be afraid to ask for help from someone, and don't give up. Don't lose hope, because yeah. um, I found hope through Christ, and uh He's walked me through this process. That's good. I, I know there's so many different things that people can do that sometimes they don't sound very spiritual. I, I'll just say a few of them, working out. That can do a whole lot for your mental ability, your mental health. Working out, eating right, doing things like that. These are things that are self-care, uh, taking time for yourself to rest and relax. Are those some of the things? That's, I just wanted to hit a few practical things. I, I, I mean, um, making time for fun. There you go. And um, this is a, a silly thing for me. I'm not a great sleeper. And um, there's something called mindfulness where um, before I go to sleep, I will, um, I will tune into my senses because I'm so in my head. And I'll say, well, what does my pillow feel like? What do my sheets smell like um, yeah. on a good day? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what... What does it feel like to be, um, to hear Joe breathing? What does, and, and I'll just go through all my senses. Joe is your husband. I want to at least, just the people <laughs> that don't know that, let's not assume that Joe is her husband. So when she. Yes. So, so. Because I don't even, know what it sounds like when Joe's breathing. And I just want to <laughs> say that. So it's different for all of us. So. <laughs> da, da, da. So, um. So, so there are just lots of things that you can do. Just take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, I have a, a whole family living with me, and right now, so my my household's gone um, from uh, two to eight, um, probably for up to a year. And and so what I do is my self care is I need an hour of quiet until seven in the morning until and I'm an early bird, and I have to do that or I will lose it. Yeah. And if I have that, I'm okay. But here's the deal. For me, self-care, like relaxing, is taking, a, you know, a 10-mile bike ride. For someone else, self-care yeah. might be vegging and, and um, you know, like watching their, their favorite show. Yeah. So it's different for different people, but you need to find what is energy in for you. Yeah, that's good. Could be a bubble bath. Could be a bubble bath. Right. right. I'll tell you one thing that is great for it, self-care at least your part in it, get to church, get in an atmosphere where you can worship, where you can set your mind on someone bigger than your problems. Just time for one last question, and this has I th hopefully been really helpful um, to just hear from counselors and how they approach it. It's not, they're just not counselors who have expertise in the field. What I wanted you to hear, these are two ladies who have struggled and battled with different forms of mental illness themselves. And I, I believe that there's so much credibility that comes from that. And both of you guys have kind of talked about that. And I believe that throughout this uh, series of talks that there are many people um, in our church that probably this series has um, stirred something in them that has spoken to uh, a battle that they have been going through that maybe nobody knows. Um, I, I want to kind of leave this conversation by asking, what is something that you guys could share with them that would give them hope? Um, what is it that we can speak today that from your perspective, your seat as, as some who have gone through and are in a battle, mm -hmm. but who also help people 
who are in this kind of battle? What can you guys say that can give hope? Lisa, what, what for you? What, what do you just want to say to people and say? I think don't give up. Yeah. Because if you just can't give up, you have to move forward. And I think it's uh, so important to, once again, the spiritual aspect is was so important to me. And I think that, uh, you know, turning to Christ, uh, he was my hope. If without that, yeah. I don't think I'd be here today. Yeah. So um, that's my, you know, uh, word to all of you is don't give up hope and find hope in Christ. Amen. That's so good. Okay, what about you? I think um, two things. Number one is... Um, there is incredible hope um, in Christ, but the only one that we can truly impact is us. And, and um, when we start, and, and, but we can impact us. When I was younger, I was terrified of uh, going crazy. Um, my dad would be hospitalized, and of course the neighbors would say, you know, my mom told me his back was out, and the neighbors would say, oh, no, it's because he's crazy, okay? And so I was scared of going crazy, and I just thought one day I would pop, maybe. And I was so afraid of, of, of stress of any kind because if I had too much, I might pop. That was what the little K thought. And so one day I was really afraid of this. I was working at a drug crisis intervention center in high school, um, and, and um, I was sick. And um, a friend, uh, the director of the place, came over and said, how are you doing? And I opened up to him. And I said, I'm actually scared to death. I'm going insane. And um, I wouldn't have done that unless I had been deathly ill. But when I'm deathly ill, I usually think I'm depressed anyway. But um, so, so he said, how are you going to do it? Are you going to take off all your clothes and run around the building? Are you going to? He said, and... And this was such life to me. He said, if you will be responsible for you, if you will just take one step and then the next step and do what is right, you'll be okay. And, and that to me was a life-changing event. And I just want to say that um, I believe you can be responsible. That doesn't mean that all your life is going to be easy. You might have tough things to manage. You can be responsible for you. You can impact your own life and your own mental health, but you can't impact anyone else's. You can be you and be a good influence on them. You can pray for them. And if you're able to let them go, then you'll be better. Yeah. So I, I think, um, I think, the message that I hope you hear is that for mental health, um, I really believe that a spiritual connection with Christ can do more for you than you could ever imagine. They both have said here today that it was giving their life over to Jesus that was the starting place. I wouldn't say the starting point for finding hope, for maybe finding healing. I wouldn't be here if he was not in my life. I would not even be here. When you say be here, what do you mean? I probably wouldn't have lived this long. Yeah. I mean, it's a strong thing to say. And I, if you're not a Christ follower, I hope you hear that. Like, this isn't just hyperbole. This is, this is, this is real. This is like, it has changed their life. I know it's, he's changed my life. I, I want to add to that and say, I think community matters. Mm -hmm. I think knowing there's a community here that will love you no matter what you're going through and what you're wrestling. That's right. Without judgment. To say, if you're battling and struggling, that's okay. You're welcome here. We want to pray with you on a regular basis. We want to do our best to kind of care for you and help you where you need help. And, and I want to say this, that if, if you're struggling with any of the things that we've talked about throughout this series, get help. Mm -hmm. We have made available a list of counselors, many of them Christian counselors, that we want to encourage you to go to. Um, get help, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, it, it, and, and I just want to say, um, just on behalf of our church, I think even just this topic is just, I think, so important. And I want to just say thank you guys for giving your lives to help other people. There's something special about people that give their lives to help other people. And so thank you guys. Um, thank you for, for not just even in that regard, but thank you for sharing their stories.
And thank you for being vulnerable. You know, it's not easy sometimes to stand up here and to say, I was abused. To say, I battled depression. To say, I wrestle with these things. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, but again, my desire has been through this whole thing is that we're going to take the stigma off of this. That's and right. that we're going to say That's that right. normal people need mental health. Yeah. Need help. <laughs> need this. And so thank you guys for sharing your stories, sharing your wisdom with us. Um, I believe it's going to help and impact so many people. Would you all do me a favor and help me thank them? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Come on, let's give it up for them. Thank you, thank you.